Hello friends, good evening to all and welcome to this session on multi-inflammatory syndrome in children. Okay, this is uh, quite a recent topic with the pandemic of COVID coming in. This disease has been associated with the COVID-19 virus, correct? And this I don't think so you might find in any of your textbooks as it is one of the most recent topic and it can be asked in your viva exam or in your entrance exam or in your theory exam for a five marker or 10 marker so it's a very highly probable question since again it is one of the recent advances in medicine okay so i guess we can begin with the lecture and today's class will be on as told multi-inflammatory syndrome in children we'll be dealing with the intersection etiology epidemiology pathogenesis of the disease clinical features, diagnosis, treatment, okay? And how do we follow up those patients and few differential diagnosis, okay? <clears throat> so just before beginning this, we'll go to few case scenarios, okay? Few case scenarios, let's just have a look. So first case, and we'll think of now, as we know, we are doing about MIC, the case is on MIC, but We'll think of what this case would have been or what this case would have mimicked if not for MISC. Okay. So, first case is of a two year old boy. Okay. Two year old boy who came with complaints of fever into six days, fever into six days, bilateral conjunctival congestion. Okay. Bilateral congestion, conjunctival congestion he had. And he had full redness of tongue, redness of tongue with peeling of the lips, okay, peeling of the lips. And he had maculopapular rash on his extremities as well as on the trunk, okay, maculopapular rash on his extremities and on his trunk with bilateral pedal and palmar erythema, okay, and palmar erythema. So this was the presentation of the child, okay? So with this presentation in a less than five-year-old child, what will we usually think of? What will we usually think of? This is a classical presentation of Kawasaki disease, correct? This is a classical presentation of Kawasaki disease. So, Next, if we have to see, we'll just look at an other case. We'll look have a look at other case. Okay, this is a second case scenario. Second case scenario is of a 13-year-old boy. Okay, this is of a 13-year-old boy who comes with symptoms of fever. Now, again, he has fever from three days. Okay, fever from three days. The child is very sick looking, okay, sick looking. Also complains of vomiting, vomiting and loose tools with severe myalgia. There was decreased urine output in the child from one day and he came in a confused state, okay. He was confused, not oriented as well. And on examination, his pulse rate was around 150 beats per minute, low volume, okay, and BP was less than 50th center. BP was less than 50th center. So now what will we think of? It is a, of a teenage boy, okay. Fever is present for more than three days, okay. And there is multi-system involvement. There is gastrointestinal involvement, there is renal involvement, there is CNS involvement, there is what musculoskeletal involvement, and the child has presented in shock. So this is something classical of huh? toxic shock syndrome, correct? It's a multi-system involvement, toxic shock syndrome, or even a case of macrophage activation syndrome, or can could have some infection triggered macrophage activation syndrome also can present this way, correct? Next case scenario we'll see we'll see next case scenario now this is of a 
seven year old child okay this is of a seven year old child okay and he presented he presented with again this is a common symptom fever okay from five days fever from five days okay and he had flushing of the face flushing was present he also had conjunctival congestion bilateral conjunctival congestion was present he had severe myalgia with joint pain he had severe myalgia with joint pain and blanchable rash was present blanchable rash was present so this child presenting in the month of august to september with this symptom okay with this symptom and on investigation there was decreased platelet count now what do you think of what do you think of in this case scenario this is again classical of anyone would like to try in your chat box this is classical of what this is a classical presentation of a child with okay dengue correct yes good rakesh this is a classical presentation of a child with dengue okay now again we'll take one more case scenario we'll take one more case scenario now this is of a 8 year old okay 8 year old girl child okay 8 year old girl child she came with complaints of fever fever was present okay into 6 days fever was present in from 6 days okay the child was again sick looking she had very bad malaise okay and she was on bed she, was, she couldn't get up from bed also okay so that tired and sick the child was okay with few gi manifestation like vomiting and diarrhea okay and on no other clinical uh, finding was present on examination as well okay and on doing investigations okay on doing investigation all the non routine investigation was done and etiology was searched for in terms of malaria dengue typhoid or because of the recent surge in rickets cell infection rickets cell infection or leptospiral infection so all these things thorough search was done but an etiology couldn't be found out in this child okay so this was somewhat like pyrexia of unknown origin uti as well was ruled out okay so this is our fourth child okay and then finally we had one more case this is of a neonate okay a 28 day old 28 day old neonate this was a child of a 28 day old neonate this child came with presentation of lethargy and not feeding well lethargy and not feeding well this was from how many days not feeding well from 5 days okay and then child also started developing tachypnea with chest in drawing okay so some amount of respiratory distress was there chest in drawing was present okay and on presentation the child was having uprolling of uprolling of eyes with generalized tonic chronic seizures okay this was the presentation of child so and on examination this child had cyanosis also okay cyanosis also and chest x ray revealed bilateral infiltrates bilateral infiltrates so this child how does this child look like this is a classical presentation of a child with late onset sepsis with acute bacterial probably acute bacterial meningitis with acute bacterial meningitis correct so all this except for this neonate who can, who might not have manifested with fever rest all the conditions one of the common symptom is fever correct and now let's see and all of them had a its own set of diagnosis okay now let's see how this mis disease came and how it evolved and how this disease mis is different from the others so before doing that 
we will come to this in the end again now let's look into our topic today today's topic so coming to introduction coming to the introduction somewhere around april and may april and may of last year 2020 so until then all of us thought that covid might not affect the children or even if it affects only mild to most of them will be asymptomatic or mild infections will be present so this was the thought until then so over there in few of the european nations and few of the states in north america what happened is most of the cases like we saw few of the cases children presented with children and adolescents in adolescent they presented with something like toxic shock syndrome and children they presented with symptoms similar to kawasaki disease or kawasaki disease with shock and one of the common pointer in all of them was all these cluster of cases were reported after the first wave of covid-19 pandemic in their respective countries so that is why a temporal association was formed a temporal association was formed between this uh, covid-19 virus and this multi inflammatory symptoms multi inflammatory symptoms okay so these were few of the case reports articles representing the case report of the same okay and they called it they called it with two names one is by the royal college of pediatric and child health they called it as pediatric inflammatory multi system syndrome okay temporally associated with sars covid 19 okay sars covid 19 and one more name by the who was multi system inflammatory syndrome in children associated with covid 19 this was the name given by who okay and later on a definitive association was found with this covid 19 as well because the same thing was found in other regions as well okay so the etiology definitive etiology was association with covid 19 and this covid 19 causing altered immune response in a child so this was the etiology that was made up now coming to the epidemiology so around if there are 1000 cases of children affected with covid 19 around m incidence of this mis is around 0.1 to 0.6 percent that means around 1 to 6 1 to 6 kids might have this and as already mentioned after this covid 19 infection mis happens within 2 to 4 weeks 2 to 4 weeks is the time lag okay so this was the time lag and next what was the age group affected most of this age group and most of the children with this altered immune response belong to slightly elder age group okay around 10 to 18 years was the age group so higher preponderance was present in older children so if we look at few of the studies less than 1 year just 7% were affected and this percentage kept on increasing with the increasing age 1 to 4 years around 28% and this 5 to maximum of them were under this 5 to 20 year category so hence the median age is around 7 to 10 years okay now coming to the pattern of the disease coming to the pattern of the disease how this disease presented in small children less than 5 years it usually presented with symptoms of kawasaki disease or in an infant <coughs> with symptoms of sepsis or rarely with kawasaki disease with shock so these were the presentation of children below 5 years and, and when it came to the older uh, children or in adolescents they came with this classical multi system involvement with hyper inflammatory state mimicking a macrophage activation syndrome or mimicking toxic shock syndrome who presented with ERDS mods or SIRS okay or with GI manifestations and many of them presented with this acute abdomen as well for which they thought it might be appendicitis a laparotomy was done or it might have they thought it was a bowel perforation and laparotomy of done was done so such presentation as well was present okay so this is how the typical presentation in their respective age group was with a slightly higher preponderance in predominance in male around 55 to 60% and there was some amount of genetic involvement as well because of this ethnicity it usually affected western population more than asian population okay and among western also 
uh, these African people were affected more, and in this Euro American nations, Hispanic ethnicity were affected more. Okay, so this was the epidemiology of the disease. Now coming to the pathophysiology, coming to the pathophysiology. What was the uh, how did this uh, what was the immune what was this altered immune state? So to have a look into it, one of this study was published by our Indian doctors only. So this was the several hypothesis that was put forward. Okay. So one of the hypothesis, sure shot hypothesis is the dysregulated immune response by our body. Okay. So initially we thought, okay, fine, pediatric, they have a very good immune response. So they hide the disease well, hence the disease is very limited. So mostly they'll present with asymptomatic or a mild disease. So that is what happened in stage one and stage two. Okay, so with the entry of COVID-19 and colonization and attachment to the AC2 receptors, there was children presenting most of them with asymptomatic infection or mild prodromal symptoms like fever or some amount of sore throat, fever, myalgia, etc. And in stage two, even if there was pulmonary involvement, most of them would have had a mild cough and mild respiratory symptoms. Okay, so this is what we had initially thought. But then later we realized this this own immune system of the children, which acted so well, itself contributed to the hyperinflammatory state. So there was a delayed hyperinflammatory phase around after two to four weeks of the COVID-19 infection. So here what happened? There was macrophage activation. This led to the activation of helper T cells. Okay, This went ahead and activated CD4 plus T cell or a B cell. Okay. So then what happened? This CD4 T cells were responsible for the cytokine storm associated with this disease. And this B cell was associated with the antibodies. And in this genetically predisposed individuals led to a hyperimmune response. Okay. That is why the multi-system involvement. Fine. Next hypothesis was molecular mimicry. And one more hypothesis was the neutrophil extracellular traps, which was formed in response to the viral infection, that itself led to an uncontrolled immunological and inflammatory state. Okay, fine. So next, let's look into the clinical features. Clinical features. Okay, so according to this article, as we all know, it is multi-system involvement. And all of them invariably present with fever. There was 100% involvement presence of fever in all the cases. Next, coming to various systemic involvement, GI was the next common system involved, around 87% of cases, 80 to 90%. Then it was dermatological or mucocutaneous involvement in terms of rash, petechiae, so macular papular rash, or just erythroderma. So various skin manifestations were present. Next was CVS manifestation, around 71%. Then came the respiratory manifestation, manifestation around 45 to 50 percent. Then there were neurological manifestations around 20 to 25 percent. Neurological manifestation in terms of convulsion, headache, or a post-COVID stroke. So all those were the neurological manifestation, and few of them had musculoskeletal manifestation as well. Okay. So next was. GIT. GIT, what was the most common manifestation? Most of them had abdominal pain. This abdominal pain might have been secondary to the vascular involvement, which had led to vasculitis, causing bowel or mesenteric ischemia. Then there was vomiting. Then there was diarrhea. Okay. And CVS involvement, clinically, there were around 30 to 35% people manifesting with CVS symptoms. But when it came to eco findings, around 71% of them were had eco findings. Okay. Next, clinically, what they would have had, tachycardia they could have had, or a bradycardia because of conduction block, or palpitation due to ectopics, or myocarditis the child would have had, or the child would have presented with shock, or the child could have had a pericardial effusion, or they could have had, because of the coronary artery dilatation, they could have had thrombosis, and this could have presented with MI, this could have presented with a stroke, okay? So all these were the clinical manifestation because of the CVS involvement. 
And on doing echo, there could have been minute to significantly reduced left ventricular ejection fraction. So left ventricular contraction was reduced. Next, there was coronary artery dilation, okay, or a thrombus would have been present. So this is an image depicting the same, the multi-system involvement, okay. This was the CNS. This was the generalized involvement, okay. This was the inflammatory markers that was raised. This being the CVS involvement, okay. Next was the respiratory system abdominal organs, okay. This was the hematological involvement in terms of thrombocytopenia or lymphophilia or lymphopenia and few of them presented with AKI as well, okay. And next, how do we diagnose this condition? So, WHO, CDC as well as the Royal College have given their own definition, okay. And this definition is more or less the same. So, first we'll read about the WHO definition, and then let's see what are the salient differences between the definition given by other institutions, okay? So most of us use this WHO definition of MISC being the age group being zero to 19 years old, and all of them should invariably have fever for more than three days, okay? And this other clinical features should be present Okay, these other clinical features are nothing but the multi-system involvement. So two or more of the organs should have been involved. So first one being the mucocutaneous skin or dermatological manifestation in terms of rash, in terms of conjunctivitis, okay, or mucocutaneous inflammation of, they can would they could have presented with strawberry tongue, they could have presented with erythema of the tongue, peeling of the skin or the lips, okay. Next vascular involvement in terms of hypotension or shock. Next was the cardiac involvement in terms of pericarditis, valvulitis or coronary artery abnormalities found on echo. Then hematological abnormality in terms of coagulopathy, okay, and GI involvement. So this is nothing but depicting multi-system involvement and two or more of the systems have to be involved. And then you need to have an evidence of raised inflammatory marker because this is a hyperinflammatory state, correct? So we'll have to have an evidence of this same in terms of elevated ESR or raised C-reactive protein or a raised procalcitonin. And any other thing could have contributed to this hyperinflammatory state. That is why what is important is to rule out other causes for this hyperinflammatory state. Hence, we'll have to rule out a, any other microbial cause of inflammation in, like bacterial sepsis or a staphylococcal or streptococcal shock syndrome, toxic shock syndrome, okay? So this had to be ruled out. Next was finally was the evidence that there was some COVID infection in the child. So it could have either been a RT-PCR positive state or IgM, IgG antibodies being present in the child. So this was the definition that was given by WHO, okay? Next, CDC also, sorry, the Royal College also gave its definition and this was almost similar with WHO. And CDC, what changes was made that in order to detect the disease early, in order to detect the disease early, fever for even 24 hours was considered and not three days. Age group was extended up to 21 years and other inflammatory markers like fibrinogen, ferritin, lactic dehydrogenase and IL-6 levels, internal kin 6 levels were included in the definition, okay? So other things were more or less same with the WHO. So this is the case definition for MISC. Next, what are the investigations we'll have to do? So as per IAP, as per our IAP 2021, they released their guidelines for the COVID-19 management. So we'll be the investigations and treatment, what we are going to learn today is based on the IAP, okay, guidelines. So if there is clinical suspicion of MISC, correct, what do we do? We go ahead and do the investigations. So if there were one thing is in our diagnosis, confirm that there is multi-system involvement with hyperinflammatory state. And other thing was to rule out other causes for the same, correct? So that is what is present in investigation also. Tire 1 and Tire 2 investigation to confirm that there is hyperinflammatory state. And other one is to rule out other etiologies that might cause this hyperinflammatory 
state. So if there was shock or life-threatening symptoms, we do both this tier one and tier two investigations together in order to not waste time. If the child was stable, initially we do the tier one investigation. If it turns out to be positive, then we will do the complete set of investigation. Okay. So now what is this tier one investigation? One is to know that there is hyperinflammatory state and hematological manifestation. So we do a CBC, we do a CRP, we do a ESR and a metabolic panel, which includes LFT, RFT, electrolytes, blood glucose, ABG. Okay. And then to establish etiology, we'll have to do an RT-PCR for COVID-19 and serology, IgM, IgG, antibody for COVID-19. Then we rule out other investigation. We rule out other etiologies, okay? So we do a blood culture and sensitivity, okay? And we rule out other diseases like malaria, dengue, leptospira, or rickettsia. If any of this turn positive, then this has contributed for the inflammatory state and treat for the same. So if all these things turn negative, then we look at our tier one investigation. If any one in each category, in this category and this category, and any one is positive, like if there is raised CRP more than three milligrams per deciliter, if there is raised ESR more than 40 millimeters per hour, or absolute leukocyte count is less than 1000, plate, there is thrombocytopenia, there is neutrophilia, or sodium is less than 135, and there is hypoalbuminemia. Okay, so one in this and one in this. If this is positive, then we go ahead and do tier two investigation. Okay. So first, next, we'll look for cardiac involvement. What is the extent of involvement of the cardiac? How do we do? We do a simple ECG. Then we do 2D echo and find, find out whether what is the left ventricular ejection fraction. So that you'll get to know about the cardiac contractility. Then go look at the coronary artery if there is any dilation. Then go look for any evidence of thrombosis. Okay. Then we can do a tropi. Okay. Tropi will tell us that there is some amount of cardiac damage present. And we can do a pro BNP. Okay. We can do a pro BNP. Okay. Fine. So these are the markers for cardiac involvement. Next, we look, go ahead and do other inflammatory markers. Okay. So this will help us to see what is the extent of hyperinflammatory state one. Okay. Second is on giving treatment. On giving treatment, we do the repeat inflammatory markers. How well our treatment has worked. So in order to see that, we do other inflammatory markers now, like procalcitonin, fibrinogen, lactate dehydrogenase, ferritin, interleukin-6, and triglyceride levels. Then you see whether there is any evidence of coagulopathy, PT, PT, INR, and D-dimer. Okay, fine. So these are the set of investigations which we do. Next, coming to the treatment. Next, coming to the treatment. So child presents with MISC, we have confirmed it with the investigation. First, we look whether it is a life-threatening disease and whether there is any shock present or not. If no, then we treat with IVIG, 2 mg per kg. Okay, so 1 mg per kg we give on the first day and other 1 mg per kg we give on the second day. So we treat over 24 to 48 hours, maximum 100 grams. And But it so happens that most of the time, the Institute might not have IVIG or the patients are not affordable for IVIG because it is a very costly drug. So in that condition, we go ahead and give IV methyl prednisolone, okay? One to two mg per kg per day. And we give aspirin, okay? Provided there is no bleeding manifestation or thrombocytopenia at three to five mg per kg per day at the maximum dose of 81 mg per day, okay? But what happens in case of a child with shock or life-threatening disease? In these children, we go ahead and give IVIG. Along with IVIG, we give methylprednisolone as well. Okay, and this and the dose is higher. Over here, it was just 1 to 2 mg per kg. But over here, when there's a life-threatening disease present, we give at 10 to 30 mg per kg per day with the maximum dose of 1 gram per day okay and we start treating with empirical antibiotics okay so even in case the child has come with sepsis if that sepsis is the cause then 
we'll have to treat it empirically with antibiotics because culture report only come after five days. Okay. So that is the reason we start with empirical antibiotics. And the patient, same dose of aspirin, we continue. And if there is coronary aneurysm present, okay, that is that score of more than 10, or if there is any evidence of thrombosis on doing 2D echo, or left ventricular ejection fraction is less than 35%, then we add on inoxaparin as well, okay, low molecular weight heparin as well, we add at 1 mg per kg, okay. BD dose given subcutaneously. So now, in spite of treating the child with all these things, in spite of hitting so hard with all these immunomodulators, still there is persistent fever or there is some end organ involvement like an AKI develops. Okay. So, or if there is increasing inflammatory markers. So, if such a condition comes, we repeat one more dose of IVIG, one more 2 mg per kg of IVIG. We repeat and we can consider other biologicals like tocilizumab, anakindra or infliximab though these are very costly drugs okay and then what about the steroids which we have given how long we treat the child with these steroids and aspirin if the child, if the condition of the child is improving, then how long do we treat the child for the same? Correct. So, if it is steroids, when it comes to steroids, we change over to oral methylprednisolone or oral dexamethasone, which is comparatively cheaper with very good efficacy after three to five days of IV medication. Okay. And then we slowly start tapering it by 25% every week and stop over three to four weeks. Okay. This is how we treat with steroids. Then if we have started the child on aspirin or inoxaparin, we continue it for a minimum of six weeks, okay? Then at the six week follow up, we do again a review 2D echo and lab values. Based on that, we decide for further continuation of this aspirin or inoxaparin. Like if the D-dimers are persistently high or if the 2D echo findings are still present, then we continue, okay? But if the 2D echo findings have resolved, D-dimer values have come low, PTI NR is normal, then we can go ahead and stop it, okay? Next, how do we follow up these patients? Now we have treated the patient well, fine, and we have discharged him. Next is coming to the follow-up because the child still has an hyperinflammatory state, so the disease can still recur. The child still has an ongoing cardiac damage. We'll have to see what has happened to that. So in order to look at all these things, we do a follow-up. So first follow-up is after one to two weeks. And at this follow-up, we get a repeat ECG, we get a repeat 2D echo, and we do a whole set of repeat investigation to see whether the inflammatory markers have reduced and the alteration that was done in the CBC has resolved or not, okay? Then again, we follow up the child after four to six weeks because this, whatever the changes in cardiac comes up, like a coronary artery dilation that comes as the disease progresses, it comes only at after one week or two weeks of illness, correct? So in order to see the changes, we again do a repeat ECG and 2D echo, okay? Fine. So this is how we follow. Now, finally, coming to the differential diagnosis. So even in case you guys go for your viva and you're asked about you, for example, you have a case of fever with rash. So please don't end up making MIAC as your first diagnosis because before this MIAC, a whole set of diseases have existed and after this pandemic goes, a whole set of disease again come, will come back to existence, correct? So this MIAC is like a diagnosis of exclusion. So this has to be somewhere in the last, but it is very good to know because since it is one of the recent advanced, they will invariably question you guys about that. Okay, so what are the other differential diagnoses we can think of? One is infectious cause, other is non-infectious cause. Under infection cause, most of these tropical infections like dengue, malaria, chikungunya, okay, or a viral myocarditis can present, or a bacterial sepsis can present, or a toxic shock syndrome can present this way. When it comes to non-infectious cause, it can be Kawasaki disease or Kawasaki disease shock syndrome, correct, or a macrophage activation syndrome, or acute appendicitis, like in a case of acute abdomen, okay, or a bowel perforation, all these things can present this way, 
Okay, now come, let's go back and have a look at our cases. Okay, look at our case scenarios. Each of the case scenarios will look and we'll see how different was this case from the routine diagnosis which we have made. Okay, so first one was a child, less than five year old child, fulfilling all the criteria for Kawasaki disease, all the criteria for Kawasaki disease. But this child on doing the routine investigation, he had thrombocytopenia. This child had thrombocytopenia. And the inflammatory markers were very much raised, both CRP and ESR. Unlike Kawasaki disease, even over there it will be raised, but not raised to this extent, okay? But not raised to this extent, correct? So both ESR and CRP are very much raised. And when it comes to Kawasaki disease, the cardiac involvement, it is the coronary artery aneurysm. There will be giant aneurysm. Okay, the, so there will be a large dilatation for the over here. Coronary artery dilatation will be present, but it is not such large dilatation or such big aneurysms. Okay, so it is more more so of the myocardial or the pericardial involvement, which will cause in tropi to be positive and BNP to be raised as compared to Kawasaki disease where it might or might not be raised because it is more of a coronary artery involvement causing which if not treated leading to MI, correct? So this is how our disease, this child was different from its normal Kawasaki disease, okay? So now let's get back. Now, how do we differentiate a child of Kawasaki disease from MISC, okay? So over here, age group is two to four years, but over here, higher age predominance, correct? Ethnicity, it affects more so in Asians, but over here it affects Westerns and Africans more, okay? Abdominal pain, there is lesser incidence and lesser severity even if present, but over here it is more common and it is more intense. When it comes to CVS manifestation, there is giant coronary artery aneurysm, okay? Over here, there is more of myocardial involvement or a pericardial involvement or valvulitis as compared to this giant aneurysm, but coronary artery dilatation can still be present, but it will not be an aneurysm. Such large dilation won't be present, okay? And acute kidney injury is more of a common manifestation in MISC as compared to Kawasaki disease, okay? Coming to investigation, in Kawasaki disease, there will be thrombocytosis, but over here, there is thrombocytopenia, okay? Inflammatory markers will be raised, but it will be very much raised when it comes to MISC. And tropi and pro BNP, as already told, since it is uh, the coronary artery involvement, it might or might not be raised, but over here it will be raised, correct? And lymphopenia is a future of MISC as compared to Kawasaki disease, okay? Now let's have a look at the next case scenario. This was of a 13 years old boy with fever from three days, sick looking, correct? And we thought of this because of this multi-system involvement, if the MISC was not existent, we would have thought that either if there was a background of any autoimmune disease like SLE or the child would have had some or the other triggering infection or he would have had some local wound a week back, which would have caused this toxic shock syndrome or macrophage activation syndrome. So this was the history we would have probed into. But our child this time presented, who presented to us on doing 2D echo, on two, doing, doing 2D echo, there were positive cardiac findings in terms of coronary artery dilation, okay? In terms of decreased left ventricular ejection fraction, okay? And again, his CRP and this thing were as usual raised, okay? And more so other investigations were similar to toxic shock syndrome or a macrophage activation syndrome. This child also had almost pancytopenia picture over there as well, you will have a pancytopenia picture, but Again, what is striking is cardiac involvement that is more so present in MISC as compared to a child with toxic shock syndrome or macrophage activation syndrome. So inflammatory markers are much higher as compared to toxic shock syndrome and cardiac involvement is much more common, okay? Now, what about the next case scenario? This was of a seven-year-old child coming in the month of August with all the symptoms depicting dengue, correct? There was flushing, there was fever for five days, there was conjunctival congestion, there was severe myalgia and joint pain, the child was very sick, and there was planchable rash. On investigation, there was thrombocytopenia as well. 
but how this case was different is his hematocrit was normal so there was no evidence of hemoconcentration that we see in dengue correct his hematocrit was normal and again crp and esr were much more raised as compared to dengue and there was again on doing 2d echo there was cardiac involvement as well so even dengue can present with dengue myocarditis not that they can't present but again the incidence is more in MISC, okay? So what are the difference? Very high CRP and very high ESR. There is no evidence of hemoconcentration and doing on doing blood investigation, MISC child will have neutrophilia with lymphopenia, lymphopenia as compared to a child with dengue, okay? He'll have lymphocytosis and leukopenia. That is the presentation in dengue. Whereas in MISC, there is neutrophilia and lymphopenia. So what were our other cases? What were our other cases? We'll have a look at it. So the fourth case, fourth case was somewhat like pyrexia of unknown origin. Okay. So no etiology could have been made out, but the child had fever of six days. Okay. And the child was very sick, malaise and prostration. But what was different in this child is, <clears throat> though his RT-PCR was negative, though his RT-PCR was negative, on doing COVID antibodies, COVID antibodies were reactive in this child, okay? And there were very high raised inflammatory markers, okay? So one of the criteria was rule out all the other causes, correct? So we ruled out all the other causes and there was significantly, there was evidence of past COVID infection in terms of COVID antibody being in reactive and there were raised inflammatory markers correct and there was multi-system involvement correct so with this background with fever for more than three days we'll have to consider misc you have the present pandemic we are going through okay next was a case of neonate okay he was this was uh, presented with sepsis or acute bacterial meningitis correct and again this child again on doing 2 d echo there was some myocarditis present on doing investigation, there were inflammatory markers were very much raised, okay? But the culture that we had sent, culture was sterile. Again, CSF analysis was normal. And CSF culture and sensitivity as well was sterile. So even in this child, there was multi-system involvement in terms of CNS involvement, respiratory system involvement, correct? CNS involvement was there, respiratory system involvement was there. Child looked like a child of sepsis, but since there was no other foci of infection, all the other etiologies being ruled out with raised inflammatory markers, with COVID antibodies being positive in the present pandemic, we should think of MISC, okay? So that's it. I think so this was a short class on MISC. If you guys have any doubts, you guys can always mail me or message me on this number, okay? And since we have recently launched our White Army app, please do download this app. It is a well-organized app wherein all the videos and all the PDF that are present are attached in this app. So it is a very handy app. Please do download it, okay? Hope this class was useful. And yeah, guess we can end. That's it for the day. Good night, guys. Bye-bye.